Iraq harbor no special objectives in Kuwait. We don't stand a chance if we don't get aid from our friends. You're dealing with, with one of the real madmen of the 20th century. This is NBC Nightly News with Tom Brokaw. Good evening. It is a prescription for war, this Iraqi invasion of Kuwait, the tiny country that is a primary source of oil for much of the Western world. The invasion by 100,000 Iraqi troops backed by air cover and tanks was brutally efficient. Iraq wants control of Kuwait's territory, its oil, and the money that comes with it. January 15, 1991. The UN deadline for Iraqi troops to withdraw from Kuwait. K-Day to 460,000 troops of the combined United States forces and its coalition partners in the Persian Gulf. These forces stand ready to launch the largest, most comprehensive airstrike in the history of warfare. The target, Iraq. More than 1,000 of the most advanced warplanes in the world are poised on the runways of Saudi Arabia, Egypt, Turkey, and Cyprus, loaded with missiles and bombs. Seconds after they receive orders to attack, sorties will soar off to strike airfields, missile sites, command and control centers, nuclear and biological weapons facilities, and troop concentrations, virtually everything of military value in Iraq. They will do so with a devastating precision that until now has never before been tested in battle. This is the story of how that devastating precision has become attainable. The story of the search for a true precision capability in the airstrikes of the past and of the advances in weapons technology, aeronautics, and training that will make Desert Storm one of the most significant chapters in the annals of aerial combat. In my direction, elements of the 82nd Airborne Division, as well as key units of the United States Air Force, are arriving today to take up defensive positions in Saudi Arabia. I took this action to assist the Saudi Arabian government in the defense of its homeland. No one commits America's armed forces to a dangerous mission lightly, but after perhaps unparalleled international consultation, and exhausting every alternative, it became necessary to take this action. World War I. Equipment was primitive, planning rudimentary. The planes were little more than motorized kites held together with glue and bailing wire. The weaponry, the means of delivering it, and the strategy for its deployment was all in its infancy. The romantic legends carved out by the pioneers of air warfare belied the fact that air power had little significant impact on the outcome of the Great War. Yet still, a few visionaries saw in this embryonic form of combat a decisive means for fighting the wars of the future. One such visionary was Billy Mitchell, the commander of U.S. Air Forces in Europe in World War I. Mitchell returned home convinced that future wars could be won through the use of air power. The bloody ground battles the world had witnessed in France would no longer be necessary. His concept was to bomb, not the enemy's forces in the field, but their industrial facilities behind the lines. It was called strategic bombing, and its goal was to cut off the enemy's capacity to make war. In a first attempt to demonstrate the power of aerial bombardment, Mitchell set out to destroy a group of obsolete battleships positioned off the coast of Virginia. On July 13, 1921, Mitchell took off to prove his point. The host of military brass in attendance 
eyed the experiment skeptically. At the time, the heavily armored battleship was the most powerful weapon in the world. Wood and cloth airplanes were not even considered a threat. To accomplish his objective, Mitchell would require a precision and destructive force hitherto unknown in the brief history of air warfare. To the astonishment of everyone in attendance, the huge ships were sent to the bottom. Air power had staked its claim on the military imagination. Although the bombing tests were a success, Mitchell's belief that air power was the key to victory remained unproven. It would be nearly 20 years after the last ship slipped beneath the waves before air power would have its first real chance to prove its worth. That place would be in the skies over Germany in World War II. The date was August 17, 1943. 376 B-17 Flying Fortresses of the United States 8th Air Force prepared to make an attack that many believed would deal the German air defenses a devastating blow. The Flying Fortress was designed to do exactly what Billy Mitchell believed a strategic bomber ought to do, deliver a heavy load of high explosives precisely on a given target from high altitude. Their targets, the Messerschmitt fighter plant at Regensburg and the ball bearing factories at Schweinfurt were precisely the crucial war production facilities Mitchell had in mind when he helped conceive the idea of strategic bombing. The ball bearings facilities were particularly important. Without these tiny steel balls, the German Luftwaffe would be unable to fly. The B-17s bristled with defensive armament. Their crews were well-trained and highly motivated. Their equipment and tactics were the most advanced in the world. But the forces that could be arrayed against an attacking formation of bombers in 1943 were just as formidable. The Germans possessed some of the finest fighter planes that had ever taken to the air. And on that day, they threw 300 of them at the flying fortresses. Attacks were savage, and the U.S. losses were heavy, but the ordeal wasn't over. When the bombers finally reached the target, hundreds of heavy anti-aircraft guns opened up on them. Using their Norton bomb sites, the best then in existence, they released their bombs. accuracy was good, but not good enough. Though damaged, the factories at Regensburg and Schweinfurt stayed in operation, and so did the German Luftwaffe. This was the first demonstration that precision bombing alone would not win a war. Later, in another theater of the war, a different approach to strategic bombing was taken. The year was 1945. The place Japan. 244 B-29 superfortresses loaded, not with high explosives, but with incendiary bombs, took off for a raid on Tokyo. It had been decided that high-level precision bombing attacks on Japanese industry had been ineffective. So new tactics were being tried. To avoid Japanese defenses, the planes would bomb at night. To concentrate their bombs, they would fly at low altitude. With equipment of the day, accurate bombing under such conditions was impossible. 
Instead, the object was to set the largely wooden Japanese cities aflame, destroying industry and its civilian workforce in one great inferno. On March 9, 1945, the worst fire in the history of the world consumes Tokyo. In one night, an area the size of Manhattan is burned to the ground. In one night, one million people are burned out of their homes. In one night, more people are killed than the atomic bomb will kill at Hiroshima. The raid was brutally effective, but the toll in human lives was horrific. Bombing could have an effect on the outcome of a war, but at what cost? Vietnam, 1965, 20 years after the Tokyo firestorm. Huge advances had been made in aeronautics and electronics. The planes were single-engine jets that could carry a heavier bomb load than the piston-powered bombers of World War II. They used sophisticated systems to aim their weapons, and those weapons were of fearsome, destructive power. The campaign was called Rolling Thunder, and its goal was to destroy selected military and industrial targets in North Vietnam. Bombing was more precise this time around, and on paper at least, the results were better. But the effect the bombing had on the North's ability to wage war was still inconclusive. The search for truly decisive results from airstrikes had once again proven elusive. December 18, 1972. The United States made the decision to launch massive bombing attacks on Hanoi in an attempt to force the North Vietnamese back to the negotiating table. The main delivery system was the huge B-52 Strato Fortress. Each of them could be crammed with close to 60,000 pounds of bombs, as much as the load of 15 fully armed B-17s. Planes flew in groups of three at extremely high altitude. Their main adversaries were modern Russian-made anti-aircraft missiles. Better known as SAMs, these missiles forced the B-52s to take evasive maneuvers that adversely affected bombing accuracy.
the linebacker two raids helped drive the government of North Vietnam back to the negotiating table. They did not force them to surrender. Aerial bombardment had once again failed to yield conclusive results in warfare. The United Nations Security Council has endorsed 12 resolutions to condemn Iraq's unprovoked invasion and occupation of Kuwait, implement tough economic sanctions to stop all trade in and out of Iraq, and authorize the use of force to compel Saddam to comply. Since Vietnam, the continuing revolution in technology has provided some of the answers to the shortcomings of precision bombing. Advances in electronics and computers have given today's weapons a sophistication and accuracy that even a visionary such as Billy Mitchell could never have imagined. The computer revolution in particular has made it possible to develop a whole new generation of smart weapons with tiny electronic brains that zero in on a target with deadly precision. So impressive is their capability that some have said these smart weapons represent the triumph of silicon over steel. Modern radar and navigation systems have given today's warplanes the ability to accurately put their weapons on target in all conditions. Forward-looking infrared night vision systems make night flying safer and easier than it ever has been. Systems like terrain following a radar allow planes to avoid enemy radar defenses by flying very low and in all weather. All these advances are incorporated in the weapons possessed by our armed forces in the Persian Gulf. Each has an impressive ability to deliver a devastating blow to a wide variety of targets. Tomahawk cruise missile. This computer-guided weapon has the ability to fly hundreds of miles at treetop altitude and put its payload practically on a dime. This 18-foot-long missile is powered by a small, highly fuel-efficient turbofan jet engine that allows for extremely long range. A tiny onboard computer reads a pre-programmed internal electronic map that guides it along a predetermined course to its target. Once there, it can deliver a variety of warheads and submunitions with devastating effect. This highly versatile weapon can be launched from a number of platforms, including submarines. Its small size and low flying flight path allow it to avoid enemy radar defenses, making it perfect for attacking heavily defended targets like airfields and command posts. The GBU-15 glide bomb. This TV-guided weapon can lock onto targets over five miles away. A miniature television camera is located in the bomb's nose. The operator in the plane acquires the target visually, then locks the weapon onto the aim point. From then on, the bomb automatically keeps the crosshairs glued on target. This version of the GBU-15 has a different wing configuration, allowing the unpowered weapon longer glide distances. The advantage of a weapon like this is that it allows the aircraft that launches it to be far away from the target it's attacking. This so-called standoff capability permits aircraft to stay safely out of the effective range of anti-aircraft defenses while still delivering a precision attack.
The GBU-15 is ideally suited for attacking fixed targets like bridges, tunnels, control centers, and surface-to-air missile sites, exactly the kind of targets that would be necessary to destroy in the early stages of an air campaign. The AGM-65 Maverick air-to-surface missile is a precision-guided tactical weapon for use against targets such as tanks, armored vehicles, and aircraft shelters. Some versions of the weapon are guided by an imaging infrared system. This allows for guidance at night and under low visibility conditions. The infrared seeker senses the heat given off by a target and turns it into a visual image. The operator then slews the missile onto the target and launches it. Another version of the missile is TV guided. Like the GBU-15, the camera in the nose cone can swivel widely and still keep its target locked in place. The Maverick would be essential in any ground attack on armored forces. Its unique ability to knock out tanks and artillery emplacements and its ability to be launched from a wide variety of U.S. warplanes makes Maverick one of the most versatile weapons in our arsenal in the Persian Gulf. Another weapon that is essential to any successful airstrike is the anti-radiation missile. This example of the type is the AGM-45 Shrike. This weapon and others like it specialize in the destruction of radar installations. Going in ahead of the first waves of attack planes, aircraft carrying anti-radiation missiles find enemy radar sites by detecting their electronic emissions. Sensors in the missile itself are then switched on and the missile homes in on those emissions, literally riding the radar beam down to its transmitter. The Shrike has been largely supplanted by newer missiles, such as the high-speed anti-radiation missile, or HARM, but the objective is the same, destroying enemy radars. Knocking out these radars is the key to neutralizing any air defense system. One of the most important U.S. aircraft in the Persian Gulf is the McDonnell Douglas F-15 Eagle. This high-performance warplane is widely considered to be the best air superiority fighter in the world. The F-15's two Pratt & Whitney F-100 jet engines give it a thrust to weight ratio of over one to one. This makes it the fastest climbing plane in history. But the most impressive thing about this aircraft is its versatility. Its two-seat version, the F-15E Strike Eagle, is one of the most advanced ground attack planes in existence. This amazing aircraft is able to perform deep interdiction missions in all weather conditions while still retaining its proven air-to-air -air capabilities. One of the few other airplanes in the world that can penetrate deep into hostile territory at low level is the General Dynamics F-111 fighter bomber. First flown in 1964, the F-111 was the world's first combat plane to use variable swing wings. This system allows the aircraft to maximize its performance at all speeds. Wings forward for high maneuverability at low speed and wings back for less drag at high speeds. It was also the first airplane in the world to carry a terrain-following radar system. 
This system connects the plane's autopilot to its radar, allowing it to skim over the ground at low altitude while the system itself guides the plane over the contours of the Earth. The F-111 can carry a heavier payload than any other fighter bomber in the world. Up to 30,000 pounds of bombs and rockets can be loaded in its internal bomb bay or slung on racks beneath its wings. These capabilities make the two-seat F-111 uniquely suited for attacking targets deep within enemy territory. The Navy, too, has its share of sophisticated attack aircraft. Leading the way is the Grumman A-6 Intruder. This carrier-based, low-level attack bomber is equipped specifically to deliver its 18,000-pound load on targets completely obscured by weather or darkness. Unlike its Air Force counterparts, the A-6 is subsonic, but like the F-15E and the F-111, it, too, has sophisticated electronics that allow it to fly low, and penetrate enemy defenses. Several squadrons of A-6s are currently deployed in the Persian Gulf. They form the backbone of the U.S. Navy's aerial striking force. The Navy's other main attack plane is the McDonnell Douglas F-A-18 Hornet. Although it lacks the A-6's night flying and low-level capability, it still possesses an impressive ability to put its weapons precisely on target. The F-18 is the most modern plane in the Navy inventory. Its advanced avionics help make it one of the few planes in the world that can perform equally well as a fighter or a bomber. In its air-to-air -air role, it can carry a variety of weapons, including the AIM-7 Sparrow radar-guided air-to-air missile. This amazing versatility allows the Hornet to do the jobs that used to take two different Navy aircraft. For this reason, the F-18 is one of the most valuable performers in the U.S. Armed Forces now serving in the Gulf. The Air Force equivalent of the F-18 is the dual-purpose General Dynamics F-16 Fighting Falcon. Smaller and lighter than the F-18, the F-16 is one of the most maneuverable jet fighters in the world. Its all-electronic fly-by-wire control system helps give it a responsiveness previously unknown in aviation. There is nothing in the world that can match the F-16 in a dogfight. In its attack role, the F-16 lacks the electronic sophistication of the F-15E and the F-111, but its Westinghouse computerized pulse Doppler radar allows it to track and bomb moving targets on the ground. It can also strafe the enemy with its six-barrel 20-millimeter Gatling gun. Like the F-18, the main strength of the F-16 is its versatility. Over enemy territory, this versatility could mean the difference between victory and defeat. Of all the advances made in the last 20 years in aircraft design and electronics, perhaps the most significant in its impact on air warfare is the revolution in low observables technology. Better known as stealth, these developments reportedly make aircraft like the Northrop B-2 bomber nearly invisible to enemy radar. Computer-aided design and manufacturing techniques give stealth planes contours that deflect radar signals. This Lockheed F-117 stealth fighter 
also uses radar absorbing composite materials in its construction to further reduce its radar cross section. Such a high premium was placed on low observability in the 117's design that significant sacrifices were made in its aerodynamic stability to achieve it. In fact, without its onboard computer automatically making dozens of tiny adjustments in its control surfaces every second, the F-117 would be impossible to fly. Its forward-looking infrared night vision system gives the 117 the ability to fly at night without emitting electronic signals which might alert enemy sensors to its presence. This gives the stealth fighter an unprecedented ability to penetrate enemy defenses, making it a perfect choice for missions like attacking anti-aircraft missile sites or heavily defended command centers. All these sophisticated weapons and aircraft have been carefully coordinated into an inter-service, multinational striking force that is more powerful and effective than anything in the history of aerial warfare. But whether this gives our air power the ability to win a war by itself, as Billy Mitchell envisioned, remains to be seen. Regrettably, ladies and gentlemen, in over six hours, I heard nothing that suggested to me any Iraqi flexibility whatsoever on complying with the United Nations Security Council resolutions. Flying fighters today is probably the purest form of combat, and that I realized that when I entered the aerial arena, that regardless uh, of the odds that there's a fairly good chance that it will all boil down to uh, me and my airplane against an opponent and his airplane and that only one of us will leave the fight. Uh, the opportunities to, for both of us to get away will probably be remote. Uh, so I have to be ready when I go in uh, mentally and physically to know that if I don't win this fight there may not be any others to follow. Training readiness, anticipation. One leads inevitably to the next. The policies that have prepared the air crews of Desert Storm were forged in the fires of the Vietnam War. An important part of that training is preparation for the possibility of air-to-air -air combat. The first thing you have to do is negate it. And the best way to do that is to break into him. You've got G available, so start your break. Okay, now we want to go from this defensive position into a neutral and an offensive position. The way we can do this with the F-14 is we can pick its nose up. Get yourself going right up into the vertical, making sure you get your afterburners lit and start going up. Lyle's going to coach you into where I am. Once you're up in here, start to do your display. Before a pilot enters the combat arena, he must first master his machine. The duty of a pilot is to control his aircraft precisely and by instinct, just as you and I might ride a bicycle. Quick like roller coaster like so maneuvers in modern do, jets can multiply stomach wrenching G forces to the point where a pilot may pass out or become down, disoriented. The trainee the must be able to drive his craft to the limits of performance, yet hold back before crossing the point of no return. Training flights are designed to take each student carefully through exercises of increasing difficulty until he is certain of his strengths and limitations and of the capabilities of his aircraft. I'll have to bring my nose down. So if you're coming over the top, you'll have a good position to start making the kill. The process of education requires daily practice in the air, combined with classroom and book work. Each day starts with a briefing in which the goals of the training mission are defined. The briefing follows the flight. Pilot, navigator, and instructor talk through each move and candidly assess the student's actions.
Controlling his aircraft is only the beginning of the story. Preparation for combat continues at home base assignments around the world. Air crews deployed to Saudi Arabia came from a variety of bases, like this one in Bitburg, Germany. After a pilot is proficient in the skills of navigation and maneuvering, the rules of engagement and the specific weapons available for his aircraft, he continues his training by flying one-on-one -on -one missions against other pilots of his squadron. Here, skill is combined with invention and endurance in one of the most demanding situations a pilot can face, the dogfight. get shot because you know that except for just being just a training scenario the mistakes that you make in this thing are the mistakes that you know you could make on a real life mission and instead of just being uh, called a kill you'd probably be killed Most of the pilots here, having been through Vietnam, they know what it means to go to combat in the air, what it means to lose friends, what it means to have to go visit a friend's wife and say, he was really great, but he's not coming home. So I hate war. I've been there. I don't want to go back, but somebody has to do it. And I'm ready. You know, my dad told me something once that was, and I still remember it quite vividly, is uh, I fought in a war so that you wouldn't have to. We keep doing it because we keep hoping someplace down the road, somebody will not have to do it. It hasn't worked yet. We've always been involved in some skirmishes someplace, so uh, to say that there won't be a war or there will be a war, I think is, is kind of uh, up in the air. We don't really know. Uh, but I will say this, if it happens, and we have to fight in it, I'll be there. Okay, well, I've got a uh, single target, uh, 20 right, 15,000 feet. We are ready to play. Okay, Claw, I'm going to put him on the side of my scope to avoid the Fox 1 going left. Eyes open, he should be right behind us. Okay, here he's going to go right below us now. Tally who you want. Okay, we've got a short tally 1, Fox 1. Tension and excitement of a dogfight seems to stretch seconds into minutes, minutes into hours. In reality, such exchanges are brief and with advances in long-range air-to-air missile technology, exceedingly rare. The real jet fighter's mission is not the mythic gunslinger's challenge to his opponent, but the protection of the bombers and the attack aircraft which carry the punch of the airstrike. The American pilots and crews in Saudi Arabia probably flew air missions at Nellis Air Force Base in a recurring exercise called Red Flag, recently renamed Desert Flag. Fighters, bombers, recon, and attack planes convened to play serious high-tech war games over the desert of Nevada. Red Flag grew out of the Air Force's experience in Vietnam. The idea was to recreate realistic sorties that would involve a variety of dissimilar aircraft in carefully coordinated missions that would match the complexity and natural chaos of combat. Simulated enemy aircraft, small tactical bombers, forward control and slow moving tank killers may work the same mission. Long range, low flying fighter bombers and other strategic and reconnaissance craft are a part of it as well. And of course, the fighters are there to fly top cover for the airstrike. The 
first order is removal of enemy radar capabilities. These are simulated by a network of transmitters that emulate known patterns of Soviet manufactured ranging and detection equipment. The next step may depend on whether the particular mission is tactical or strategic in nature. Either way, the pilots may have to contend with simulated anti-aircraft fire and smoky SAMs, a simple though effective simulation of the surface-to-air missile threat. Now the bombers come in at low level. Precision timing controlled by a radar plane orbiting hundreds of miles away from the point of impact. Red flag exercises continue for two weeks at a time. During this period, each pilot will fly 10 missions. He will work in close cooperation with the other members of his team to complete his daily assignment. There is no place here for the Hollywood stereotyped Lone Eagle. Flying large numbers of aircraft in close proximity is a dangerous exercise, even in practice. Requirements for close cooperation, planning, and precision are at an all-time high. The 10 mission requirement tests endurance and judgment under pressure. Pilots who survived their first 10 missions in Vietnam were much more likely to survive their full combat tour. Red flag is the Air Force design to give each pilot his 10 combat missions before he ever reaches the battlefield. Today, American air crews have achieved the highest level of education and training in history. The men and women who make up the American air commitment to the Desert Shield Force have spent their careers in constant training. Their state of readiness is at its peak. In January 1991, they await future events with keen anticipation, but with few illusions. I believe anybody that's been in combat uh, will be only more than happy to tell you that he probably does not want to go through the experience again because it's a very painful experience. Uh, the fear you learn to live with, but you never learn to live with losing close friends and uh, by the nature of the beast that occurs quite frequently. So I can say that I do not uh, actively uh, hope that we have another conflict, but nevertheless, my job is to prepare for one. Uh, and if I look at uh, the current uh, world situation and assess that there will be no conflicts in the future, then really there is not much meaning to my job. So I have to be ready to go fight. Uh, and if I'm called upon, of course, I'll be the first uh, one to volunteer to go because that's essentially what my mission is. But to desire it, I think, is uh, something that's far different. And I don't believe that people that have been there before are ex very eager to face that type of situation again. We'll go until it's over. Well, the president sent us here, and we're the president's home. So I, any time, any place, that's how I feel. So if that's one year or two years from now, that's how long I'll stay here, and I'll do my job and do it proudly. Just two hours ago, Allied Air Forces began an attack on military targets in Iraq and Kuwait. These attacks continue as I speak. Ground forces are not engaged. This conflict started August 2nd, when the dictator of Iraq invaded a small and helpless neighbor. Kuwait, a member of the Arab League and a member of the United Nations, was crushed. Its people brutalized. Five months ago, Saddam Hussein started this cruel war against Kuwait. Tonight, the battle has been joined. As I report to you, Air attacks are underway against military targets in Iraq. We are determined to knock out Saddam Hussein's nuclear bomb potential. We will also destroy his chemical weapons facilities. Much of Saddam's artillery and tanks will be destroyed. Our operations are designed to best protect the lives of all the coalition forces by targeting Saddam's vast military arsenal. Initial reports from General Schwarzkopf are that our operations are proceeding according to plan. Our objectives are clear. Saddam Hussein's forces will leave Kuwait. 
the legitimate government of Kuwait will be restored to its rightful place, and Kuwait will once again be free. Iraq will eventually comply with all relevant United Nations resolutions, and then, when peace is restored, it is our hope that Iraq will live as a peaceful and cooperative member of the family of nations, thus enhancing the security and stability of the Gulf.